Lita Eilars go. It's such yes. a pleasure to be here with you today and to have you, um, you know, make time for the Meta Art Club in the midst of a busy, busy schedule. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank Thanks you. Thanks for calling. <laughs> um, I am so inspired by your work and I just wanted to start with that. Um, and love, I love the fact that your Instagram bio states, and I'm going to quote you, my avatar is a painter obsessed with cosmos, chromotherapy, plants, quant stuff, crypto stuff, and the future. This is my metaverse. I mean, that's really powerful. <laughs> it was before Mark Zuckerberg claimed the word. Good that you said that, because that metaverse thing, I have to I have to edit that. That was before he, he took ownership of that. <laughs> Well, I, I don't think he has sole ownership of the metaverse, does he? <laughs> I don't know. I think he will. Eventually, he will. In a <laughs> few years, up. no one will remember that anyone else, that, that, yeah. that we all owned it before him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just wanted to start by asking you, you know, how... Um, Dita, did you start your journey as an artist? And I know that you started as a multidisciplinary artist before you morphed into digital art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I um, I went to to a few art schools here in Scandinavia. Um, graduating from Malmo Art Academy in Sweden and. Um, also with a semester in New York at Cooper Union. And that's basically my training. I graduated in 2009. And I came, actually I applied to the academy um, with video works. This uh, video where I'm running around in this game, computer game-like universe collecting brushes and paint for doing paintings and um, so I made this little computer game video which I was accepted with at the academy and then I didn't work too much in digital um, medias for many years I've been painting basically um, and then a few years ago I did some sound sound works and then like three years ago, I began working with digital imagery again. So it's still a little bit new to me and I um, I have my painting practice um, going on also now. So I'm trying to, um, now I'm trying to pair those two together and see how they can be exhibited together in museums and stuff, how the two different ways of working can go together. You mean, when by the two different ways, do you mean the sound design with your digital work or your digital work as a whole with your physical work? With paintings, yeah, with my paintings, oh. basically. So right now I'm doing um, some huge, huge carpets, hanging carpets with my, this uh, the wrestler's motif on in different ways, uh, made of wool, so like, like four by four meters, really big ones, a series of those that will be going somehow in the same installation as some huge paintings I'm working on. So oh, that's man. for um, Nikolai Konstal in, in, in Copenhagen in mm -hmm. the beginning of next year. It's, it's an old church, so it's like this divine, divine space. Um, so that I'm looking forward to. Amazing. And um, do you have a big team working with you or do you work with fabricators or how, how do you work? Um, I have a lot of freelancers that I hire again and again. Mm -hmm, then I have mm -hmm. a really good assistant as well. But I normally, it all varies so much what I need. And so it's, um, but I mean, some, some, I are freelancers, but I'm basically, um, you know, in my sphere all the time anyway. Mm -hmm. But the carpets are made, I mean, they are made, 
they have woven at it, this big factory, but they're not, it's not like a woven carpet that you are then, um, that you've printed on. It's like every little uh, pixel on my digital version is then a thread of the, of the wool. So it's been a really big process of, of learning that system and knowing how to translate something digital into, into weaving, which is then basically the same thing, you know, it's also a picture that is made up of a lot of small parts. Got so it. they asked me, they asked me <laughs> the first tests we did, they were like, yeah, so you have to send me this picture where the dimensions are four by four meters, like really, really big. And then the resolution is, uh, you have to set that as seven DPI. So like this really, so it looks really pixels. Um, you just normally, you, you're there asking for like 300 DP, DPI, right? So that was just a yeah, fun thing that they ask for seven so that you can really see the, the, the way the picture is built up. I see. And when you say they were asking, who was asking? Oh, the, the factory that does them. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I see. Okay. And um, this year, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Copenhagen um, had an NFT of your 3D sculpture of the wrestlers, which you're just, yeah. you were just talking about. And um, this was as a result of the museum inviting you as the one and only artist to create the 3D work for them this year. So yeah. that's obviously huge um, accolade um, and congratulations. And I wanted Thanks. to ask, you know, um, A, about that process and how you got selected, and then about the Creative Commons process of storing your NFT for perpetuity. Yeah. Um, well, I, Denmark is a small country, which is sometimes, a really good thing <laughs> because I posted um, a lot of images of these digital sculptures um, like for the last years but I had never really found a place that could store them or that could hold them because every time I every time I printed them and hung them on my studio wall or tried to, I, mean, I mean I had the, scu the sculpture on my computer only because I wanted to create sketches for paintings. I, I worked really frequently before and I wanted to get back to that. So I had the, the 3D sculpture in my studio only to be able to see from different angles what kinds of sketches were possible for paintings. I see. So, so I, I posted a lot of pictures of that also because every time I then painted a painting with this motif, I was not satisfied. They completely lost that sci-fi backlit um uh, avatar kind of a feel that that the 3d mm -hmm. sculpture had in in the different viewing programs that i saw it in um creating those sketches so it just always didn't it it didn't really do that thing that i wanted it to when it became paintings but then in the beginning of the year i i began minting some of these sketches on uh on OpenSea. And I just, uh, on Instagram, I was just basically just uh, talking a little bit about that process and about finding a frame that could hold the idea of this futuristic look that I was going for. So yeah. I sort of just posted a, a few images of that. And since Denmark is kind of a small country, I guess word got around, not that I have a lot of followers or, you know, but it's just a small place. So the curators, maybe had asked some friends or curious. So, mm -hmm. so they had seen my work there and they just contacted me not really knowing. They were like, we don't really know what we're asking for, or what, where this is going, but can we just talk, just talk us through your process. So over the, the course of a few months during the spring, they, we kind of developed this, um, this uh, collaboration where in the end, they bought my source file that I'd never really seen as art because it was just a tool for, for my, for my sketches for paintings. But, um, and then when together we came up with the idea that that we would let um, the sculpture be a public global sculpture, so that mm -hmm. you can uh, via an and uh, a QR code you can. Um, 
scan and then place the sculpture on your desk next to a cup of coffee or on the lawn of your um, next to your house or at the parking lot or whatever so that it's a sculpture that's accessible everywhere and you can place it wherever you want so um and that i thought that was a really generous thought um and a good way to sort of also show that the metaverse and all the digital possibilities is not always all about money but it can also be about sharing and and um, giving access to your thought process through your work for free yeah, um, yeah but then i made like a this spinning gif which represent this whole new way of thinking about ownership but then also claiming that that idea and that giving free of the ownership has an ownership <laughs> and that so i made it in five different versions at misa this um Johan Koenig's gallery in, in Berlin. So mm -hmm. it was through them that I uh, got it on chain through the gallery. So um, yeah, that was the sort of the way, what was your second question? <laughs> My second question was about, was about the creative commons process of storing your NFT, yep. but you've, you've expanded on that really, really nicely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's so exciting. So, so when this process of uh, the Misa Koenigs Gallery in Berlin helping you um, elaborate the work in this way, I mean, was that a different process from when you minted your NFT? Um, I mean, the first ones that I'd minted just on OpenSea and Foundation in the, in the beginning of the year, I just mm -hmm. did that. I mean, I made some sort of rules and collections and yeah um and this other one was a little more yeah developed through the museum the museum of contemporary art and mm -hmm. and misa the way that we were trying to come up with another ex access to to the file and another way of um yeah of negotiating the that um that idea of ownership and accessibility and yeah, so it was a very different process because the the ones that I the prude and crop series that I have on OpenSea mm -hmm. they are basically just you know two D images that I chose, right, and minted. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and then the new series that I the render crop series that I'm introducing now they sort of follow the same uh, logic as the prude and crop series, so they will also like be two D two D uh, pictures. Okay, but you also work in 3D. Yeah, for that yeah. one piece. I have another thing coming up too, but um, but not really normally. <laughs> yeah, not really. But I'm okay. doing no. But I, but the thing is, I may, I might. I don't know. I'm doing this huge installation for that um, that museum show that I have coming up where I'm. It's at this. So there are two floors in the in that Constal in that old church. And the upper floor is like so, like a huge space. Also, mm -hmm. I don't remember how big, but there will be like 20 projectors projecting up uh, on the ceiling. And then there will be this like huge film with different, with these 20 different projectors. And you'll be mm -hmm. lying on the floor, taking your shoes off, lying on the floor on these carpets that I made. So there will be a lot of imagery there that could somehow go into 3D works as well. Um, yeah, that could be minted. I don't know. So I have a lot of material. I just, but I think also for me, there has been no, it's not um, urgent just to mint everything you have on your computer or every thought that you have. It's not really, it has mm -hmm. to be for a purpose or for, um, there has to be a reason for it. Otherwise, I can't really see why, why I do it, right? <laughs> So yeah, I had yeah. my idea with the first ones that I minted in the spring and, and sort of the source to other things that I have minted has been these, these wrestlers and the idea that I find like a source of healing power in that sculpture that can actually help people understand something about their own blood and their own uh, energy paths. And um, so that's why I have minted them 
to be able to, so that people can hold that idea as a token in their pocket somehow on their phone, that they can see that idea and remember those, um, that concept that I have behind that. And maybe that can be like this little sculpture in your hand that you can remember and, and, and make use of. So can you tell us about how you came up with that idea of helping people um, and this work as a source of healing power? And I just want to just preface that question with just letting everyone know in case they don't know already that your wrestlers are women. Yeah. So it's yeah. a, I had a, um, a, a just a, f- a photocopy of, um, of the uh, the wrestlers that's in Uffizi, the original mm-hmm. male wrestler. Yeah. And um, I had that for a while on my studio wall and I didn't really know what that thing wanted from me. But, um, but since I was uh, pregnant with my second child and I had a really hospitalized, dramatic birth of my first child, I okay. sort of used that that photo as a way to understanding the two powers that's um, present in any human body, but especially during birth, that either your body kind of chooses the path of adrenaline, you get frightened, you scare everyone else in the room, you get, you know, put all these things in motion as happened with my first birthing situation. Mm -hmm. And then there is the other hormone that can flow in your body that is uh, oxytocin. And that hormone is the <clears throat> the hormone that is like is healing you. I mean, if you if you move on adrenaline all the time, then there is never that. Then your body thinks it's in fight or flight, so there's never time for healing, like a cold or cancer or anything that's coming because it's just trying to escape. You know, the lion that's hunting you. So uh, it's important to tap into that other, especially during birth because if you tap into that, you can't have 20% adrenaline and 80% oxytocin, it's either or. So your body kind of can only be in one of those modes. And when I learned about that, then I understood that those two wrestlers for me represented that idea, but then I couldn't really use it because it was men and these super muscular, almost cartoony men from like, I mean, created thousands of years ago, but yeah. So then I just uh, uh, began working on drawing up the same sculpture in as women. And then from that, placing them in this weird scene, um, also from a Renaissance um, idea, um, from there is this guy called Hans Vredemann de Vries, who made these beautiful architect drawings of, of uh, central perspective and how that was supposed to be understood in relation to yeah creating paintings basically or and creating architecture of course and he was an architect himself and um, I just all these images that he made um, drawings and prints they look like computer games from now I mean it's just weird things that he plays just to explain the central perspective like weird boxes on a weird you know so I just I got inspired by by one of his uh, drawings, just to have some sort of scene for the wrestlers to be standing in. So that was, that's also what I'm, have, uh, what I'm minting with you. That's the, there's a lot of these, this architecture is still present in those images. So, um, so yeah, that was uh, a lot of information. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, again, but... so interesting, so interesting, indeed. So the way that you articulated that. Um, the two powers present at birth and I know that you have and how that informed your work um, this work in particular and I know that you've actually got a work called oxytocin oh yeah it's sort of yeah that's I had yeah I had a sort of I have a framework for that because the, the the two wrestlers one of them look a lot more relaxed and complete in the way that she functions that's the okay. upper one in my in my sculpture, and uh, mm-hmm. so she is sort of the goddess of oxytocin, and she was completely with me for that um, that second birthing uh, situation for me because I so I decided that I um, 
I lived far away from the hospital in a, in an old schoolhouse in the countryside. Mm-hmm. And I decided that even though I completely proved the other, uh, proved opposite the first time, then I knew that I was able to do this without any intervention at all, alone with the with my boyfriend and one midwife in my in my bedroom and not with a lot of machines in the hospital. <laughs> so I was like, this yeah. is possible because I just need to tap into that, you know, divine sort of energy from that, from the goddess of oxytocin. And I did, it was the most beautiful, peaceful, painless experience of all times. And w- when you look at the paper, you get here and scans, maybe at least you get a paper of like every little step during the, those, um, during childbirth and when you look at the papers then they the two the complications or whatever were with both ch- children were the exact same it was just the way that it was handled on the first occasion and the, all the panic that happened and all you know everything I mean adrenaline is a really powerful thing it can really spread into other people and the fear that you have also on especially during COVID and everything I, f- I feel like the spreading of fear is a really it's more dangerous than the disease you know it's a really yeah. fucking powerful thing and it makes people sick and yeah 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 that's that's a really powerful um personal narrative to share as the backdrop to your work and and you know how incredible that you went through both of these experiences but the second one you managed to overcome the extreme trauma that you went through the first time um when you're supposedly in kind of the safe yeah. hand the medical system which is actually as you say feeding the fear and and um not giving you any options of how you you know how you can create yeah. that situation the way you want to because you're in this huge framework around you and 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 it's kind of pre preset for you yeah I'm beginning to think that actually there's a lot more that the human body can do if we allow it you know that there's actually um maybe healing of of really uh dangerous diseases even I mean you've seen the the effect of placebo I mean, if if you really believe and you have that positive energy that can really that can really heal you, you know, yeah. that's the, the what so many studies of placebo has showed that if you think you are on a path of healing, then you end up on a path of healing. Yeah. And I can't believe that, you know, that is not taken more serious in the medical system. But I, I'm also of the belief that there's a lot of other um factors that play in right now at this place of of human history that we are in right now there's a lot of money and big pharma things that that need to to play their role as well but i just think there's endless possibilities in um, in the human body within that thing that you create between your heart and your brain right that there's something yeah. there that uh, is very interesting mm. yeah and uh the logic doesn't do it justice yeah 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 Yeah. and when you uh when you create like the work that you're creating for this church with the you know this church setting obviously not a church um with the 20 projectors and the carpets and I mean how do you how do you start thinking on that scale does this does this begin um Dita for you as a small idea that then just kind of attaches itself to more and more possibilities and then um or, or yeah. do, you know do, do you look at the space and go I'm gonna use this to its fullest or how does that process work for you it's weird it's a little bit the same as where does information uh, inspiration come from or some something like that because now that I have the sketch I have a big model in my my other studio where you know everything is planned out and the files for the carpets are sent and I'm just working on these huge canvases right now. But so mm-hmm. it looks like everything is, you know, just in the right place. I just have to finish up. But how the hell did it all end there? I have no idea. You know, it, it is, as I think, as you said, I think it's a little bit 
like one one idea or one image or the idea of this the goddess of of oxytocin and how can you present that and give with both with audio and and light and these works how can you create that that feeling within people and how can you get them to tap into that energy so i think it's just um, but and also it's about frankly it's about people believing in me asking me to fill a huge space you know um and for that to happen you have i mean i filled a lot of i filled a lot of uh smaller big spaces before that so it's just you know from some smaller gallery shows to bigger shows to institutions and museums and then i think i think that right now i'm doing these five huge canvases that are way too big to even get into my door here so i have another studio where i'm making those and um so i'm putting them up in this uh, in the constal but i have no idea where to you know i can't have them at home afterwards i don't know what to do with them but i think it's important sometimes just to to manifest that thing that big thing and then that can generate something in the future it's difficult for, for people to say oh we believe in you to fill up this entire you know this huge solo show if you haven't done something i mean it's easy enough to say i'm capable of making huge works but you just have to at some point you just have to do it and then if you have to throw it away afterwards or, or store them i mean that's just um i think it's important to try to manifest something if you need something bigger to happen it's just a step on the ladder so you have to have to just do it <laughs> yeah absolutely i love that i love that um philosophy and and do you think um dita that nfts are going to solve that problem of you having to at some point i'm not saying now. All, all the shit yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly you know, you'll never, you'll never have to destroy it. I mean, maybe you want to destroy a work. That's, that's your, your personal prerogative. But, you know, you'll never have to destroy something because you don't have the space to keep it. Yeah, yeah. Is there a freedom well, in course. that? Oh, yeah, there is. There is. But I very much like physical things. I like the building up of, of color on my canvases. Mm -hmm. And so I have definitely have one leg in the old dense world still. Um, but I can totally see how people feel, especially those younger than me and those traveling the world more than me at this point, they feel um, heavy with all these like fancy furnitures and cars and, you know, stuff and stuff and stuff. And you have to take care of it and you have to not break it. And if you're moving or, I mean, I can see the logic in having everything that's valuable in your little phone you know i have yeah. all the pictures of my kids i have some really important nfts that i bought early on and stuff like that and all your you know your bank codes and everything everything is there in that little phone so i can totally relate to art being in that phone as well yeah absolutely but then at the same time there's an irony in that because you know your part of your art is this totally immersive physical viewing experience that is mm. you know space that's informed by the space it's informed by the, the touch of a carpet or you know like lots the of the time that yeah the time that's yeah. put into but I mean time can be put into digital work as well so yeah I don't know but, but I actually what I yeah. see sorry for interrupting <laughs> what I see in, in, in that show that I'm doing now with this huge a film installation I don't value those digital works that is going on that ceiling less than the paintings that I have also spent many many hours and a lot of uh, you know a lot of waste of time also but both works carry a lot of hours and a lot of intention yeah from my hand so I don't value the digital works less in any way you know that's great um but but there isn't that tactile experience for you involved in creating. So does that does that feel different when you're creating and you're, you know, you're working? I don't know how you work on a screen, but could you take us through that process, Dita? 
Yeah, and, and I think just about the tactile, um, there's so many ways that a digital, digital piece can look like. And I'm always going for this, for a really soft add-on. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time on on actual that actually that's the tactility of it and the way that it's not just like you know the sharpest colors the sharpest lines but that there is a softness uh, to it as well. So yeah, I give that a lot of attention to. So and it is the same as a physical tactile thing. I don't really I don't really see the difference because I that's yeah. something I have also spent a lot of time. And developing those those actual the way that that the color sits on that screen even though it's a backlit screen and not a canvas with the light on it's still uh, about the way it looks also um and and especially for these three pieces that i'm minting now with you i have because they come from the process of rendering when i've those i was working on in in Photoshop doing with something else in mind. And, and that's a lot for me. The thing that there's so much that I'm not showing, that I'm not minting, that I'm not showing in museums. There's a vast, you know, <laughs> folders on folders on folders uh, of works that are just te tests and experiments. And I mean, things, some things are good too, but sometimes you just have to choose instead of putting everything out, you have to choose a line and stay in it. And yeah. so for those works, it's these beautifully, these things that, that um, Photoshop create in the process of rendering out like a high risk image for, for printing. Mm -hmm. I found out because I had, because on the piece that I have on foundation, I, I promised a physical print next to the NFT. And so I had to uh, render out that that exact uh, so that it could be minted and you could you know have that upon buying the piece on foundation. And then I I was just amazed by the the thing that Photoshop does in that process. All these like calculations that is then translated to some sort of image just for you to be able to see how long the wait is. I mean it's not something I guess Photoshop needs for anything, but it's just a a part of the process. Um, so I kind of did a lot of experiments, experiments with that, zooming in completely so that you could see how the, the pixels were working and changing. And yeah, so that's why that's why they, they look the way they look, those images. Yeah. And that um that series that you created for the Meta Art Club Dita, um, you know, we gave you a theme, a new beginning. How did you how did you off that? Yeah, I mm, because it's this um, <laughs> yeah, because it's this um a rendering out of a file is the calculation the calculations and the way that everything has to be constructed in a new setting to be presented in a new way. So that was kind of kind of my rough translation <laughs> into that. Um but also um that whole scene that I've created for the restless and the idea of the restless is still also fits very very well into that idea of the new beginning. I mean, imagine if all humans on the planet were only riding on oxytocin and not adrenaline. I mean, there are so many problems would solve themselves <laughs> if that was the only driving force that people had was only kind and and uh, never rushing or never stressing about it, anything. I think that would uh, that would be a really nice world to live in. <laughs> Utopia. Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's that's. Thank you. Um, thank you for outlining that. And I, you know, you've highlighted um, a little bit about when when, for example, the you know. Um, the Contemporary Art Museum of Contemporary Art in Copenhagen has come to you and even though they've asked you to tell them about your work you've kind of come about the work creating the work together or at least how the work will be uh, you know how how the work will be um, pushed out to 
people around the world through a QR code, for example. So I, wa I wanted to ask you, um, do you, do you see what's happening now with NFTs, Dita, as a digital renaissance? Is that is that a word that you would be comfortable using? And why is that? Or is that a term that you would be comfortable using? Renaissance as in it has existed before and now it got kind of redeveloped. Is that what you mean? Because when I think I, of Renaissance, it's it's more like that you take something in the Renaissance, you took something from the from the past and and kind of reculturate cultivated that. Is that the way you think about how 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 digital works have existed for a while, but now they had some sort of next level to them? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I also thought of it, especially in the beginning. Um, uh, of the spring when everything was so fresh and there was a lot of people coming into the into clubhouse and talking mm -hmm. about nfts and bef before the huge huge christie's sales and that um there was this extremely generous and um uh, open-minded um feel to those clubhouse rooms especially uh, where everyone was excited in the same way as, and I thought of of how we are now romanticizing around um, the avant-garde movements in Paris, for example, when if there was this a, a feeling that things were happening and everyone was invited and everything was so positive. I lost it a little bit after a few months because, and I might be wrong, I might have framed that, but <laughs> I I thought that there was a lot of, um, uh, there was a pull towards these very friendly, not to mistake, very friendly young white men in those spaces that were very inclusive, but there was just, it became a fan culture very fast for some, where certain uh, artists were like taking being alpha <laughs> alpha males and they were really friendly it was not that they were toxic in any way but there was just a pull towards them that whenever you came into a room people were being fans in a way all the time so so the conversations shifted really fast and I had to go off all social media and concentrate on on all the other things that I have in my life so so I left it a little bit angrily or a little bit like okay I thought there was a new beginning I thought it was a new way where everyone was included and women were included as well. But then those were also just human beings that just fell into human nature. And the human nature that we have cultivated, cultivated is a pull towards strong men um, that could en encompass all, all of that, all those uh, desires for, well, tell me what to do and blah, 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 and giving advice in a really nice way. But but it just, I was just like, no, not again. This was what we were trying not to, yeah. But anyway, and then for a while, I was in these room where a lot of, especially women were, you know, disappointed and angry. And then that also became, you know, a repetition of all feminist movements that for the last 100 years, right? That we're just like complaining instead of, then becoming that authoritative person, you know, just like in another room complaining about it. And I was like, oh my God, I have to, you know, I have to leave this now, but it's, it's just a copy of the real world, you know, <laughs> or a yeah. copy of all the things that have happened before. And I was just like, I was really excited that there were people from all over the world, world and, and men, women, old people, really young people. There was just a really um, nice mix of people to begin with, but um but i think and and it was it was really basically because there were a few of these guys especially american guys that that were able really fast to uh have some sort of financial uh background so they could quit their day job and then they could be there all the time taking care of everyone and being really nice about it and then therefore selling more and being i mean i guess they're billionaires today right six months later but um not everyone were able to make that um, make that jump somehow. 
because yeah. you need some sort of um, stability or at least yeah I don't know why why not someone from Peru or a woman from China were were able to to fill up that I don't know it just seems like if you are yeah I, I don't have the answer this is yeah this is a boring conversation also but it, no. it was just like I was no, just no. um I just left it a little you know disappointed and I clearly don't yeah. have the answers to how, to how to start over but um <laughs> but it was just very promising to begin with yeah that whole and community I don't know if there is a community now there probably is still but yeah yeah no I, I I appreciate you sharing that and and I see exactly what you're saying um and I wanted but to... here we are two women at least two <laughs> white women but still women <laughs> you know sitting here talking about it yeah. and there you know in all fairness as well there are you know, a, a solid proportion of our artists as part of the Meta Art Club who are either African-American women or African women, mm. uh, Chinese women, female artists, um, Korean female artists. Mm. And it is disproportionate. I don't want to, you know, kind of sound like I'm critiquing the NFT space. It is disproportionately male, generally. But the collectors who feeding the whole of this system right <laughs> why well, yeah. i can't say that because oh, the, you know um frank is such, a, such an incredible proponent frank schmidt of mm. of the nft space and, and collecting an artist but at the same time he's so it's his mission to be inclusive so mm -hmm. that that's a big and also part i think of, it's not and it's also of, yeah it's also not, it's, the, what I understood in the beginning of the year was that you can't really blame them. These guys were really friendly and generous and they were teaching others how to do it, how to even you know, set up a wallet. And they were really friendly. So I understand why people like them and why they want to know more and oh, tell more about your life and everything. You know, I get that because they were really friendly. And what's wrong with that? You know, <laughs> it's just like, why is it that it always comes down to to those patterns that's just what i find interesting not that i mean I'm, I'm happy that there are collectors no matter where they come from it's not really i just wonder where the others are why they didn't tap into it and the same with the females but maybe as i you know they got sort of i don't know yeah i don't i don't have them you can you can edit all this out <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> okay I, I <laughs> you can keep it <laughs> <laughs> um on that note you know how how have you cultivated your nft collection and is this something that you know you have a finite amount of wall space in your home and this is now kind of another way that you acquire the work of artists that you whose works you love or you admire or how, how does that work for you no i have them all on my phone um, okay many are still in in those different wallets from the from the different platforms i don't know if there is a place where you can collect things that you bought from all different kinds of without taking them off chain i had i did that in the beginning i have a lot that are just you know on my um meter mask yeah and yeah some are still in the open sea so so i wish i had them all in one app there is probably that available now but not that i know of but i, I don't, don't know, i, I there is. No, don't yeah. think it's yeah yeah because yeah, that that would be nice to have um but um yeah so i made a little some of these online galleries that were developed in the spring i have some of those but other than that it's just something that you know i have on my phone i have yeah it, uh, but also I, where i lived before we had a lot of art because i both with nfts but also with them real artworks i have swapped a lot with the colleagues over the years so i have so so much but uh, when we moved here six six years ago so we were just like oh, the walls are so empty and clean and you know in the studios my my boyfriend is an artist as well and we live in this old school as i said and he he's in the other classroom and i'm here and then we live upstairs and it's so nice to just go upstairs and then it's just like wait 
like when we just moved in so we haven't put up much actually because it's still <laughs> in storage but uh, we have it that's and that's great. something a lot of the a lot of the thing about art is also just and that's why i really understand the ownership situation of 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 a jpeg that everyone can own but just to know that i have it i don't need to hang it on my wall just that i know that i have it <laughs> you know? yeah. i have yeah. that with a lot of physical works you know i have it yeah can, you know unpack it at any moment i know i have it you know? <laughs> yeah and on with that do you you know do you see that nfts are changing artists lives in some countries um i mean all around the world they're mm. they're, give, they're giving artists more agency over their commercial careers so to speak that that possibly didn't exist before is that something that you've observed what i find really interesting and what i am looking forward to seeing developed is how a lot of illustrators and graphic designers and that were explicitly not um you know accepted in the fine art world maybe now they get like sort of a room in that in that you know museum in our head of what is art because they weren't there before i mean the fine the fine art world is so closed around what is really art and what is just commercial or kitschy or whatever and now i don't see how they can be excluded any longer and that said i still because i'm trained in that you know academy old school way there's still so so much that hurts my eyes so so i'm not saying this from a personal point of view but from a more general art art historic viewpoint it would be interesting to seeing later on how that shift happened and then oh now we can include like like when sound art was included to fine art or whenever video or was included to to find out how that you know that the graphic designers and and all those different kinds of fields that i don't even know anything about when they were included if if that's what is happening now because i think it is and those mm -hmm. um standards that are set by the fine art fancy magazines and and uh, curators how what does that do now what does that shift do when so many others are are claiming to be part of the art world um because before there was one at least one of the um criterias was you know huge sales on auction i mean check <laughs> They can't really deny it, and and yeah, there's still a lot of things that I don't find either interesting, or beautiful, or any or provocative or anything, just like kitschy. But um, I guess there was a lot of art that I thought that about. There was also a lot of art that of artists everywhere that know they are doing art, and they might even be doing it full time. But they are not included in the art world. They are just, you know, art that someone is selling out of their studio or something, you know. But they feel like they are part of the art world. The art world do not feel like they are part of the art world. But there's just so much, so much um, going on right now where where those lines are not clear any longer. I don't know. I have no clue what is fine art and what is not. And it would just be interesting to, you know. Be 20 years into the future and, and and look back and see if this is some sort of a renaissance or an, a, a, a time where a new branch of the art world was developed or at least accepted because the, also when you think of if you just look 100 years back in time and just think about the the first um, free artists that weren't commissioned by the king or or a rich person but, and they just did like figurative works that were towards the abstraction. They just painted a little different. And everyone in the established art world were saying that it was not art. It was just too bad to be art. I mean, isn't that the exact same thing that's happening now? 
And uh, they are, now that when we think of what is real art, that's what we think of, you know, a Picasso or whatever, but they were not, <laughs> they were not accepted. So, yeah. So, so, so even though I might not fancy a lot of the, of this digital art that's been produced, I don't think it's too deep or anything, but uh, a lot of it I, I, is just created for commercial opportunity. And, but I guess, isn't that fine? I mean, why not? It's also, it also reflects our contemporary world and the, w the way the things are and how everything is, is rolling at the moment. So why not? Why is, I think this will be just another proof of, of uh, catching the contemporary um, mind in a way, you know, that art also became, you know, collectibles in that way. Uh, as so many other things are design, whatever, and that, that, that and that there is all these other mechanisms that make the world spin around it's, again, big farmer and money, all of that. Um, I think uh, these new trails are just, uh, yeah, a, po a portrait of our time. I think that will be much more visible later on. <laughs> like the yeah. Picasso, it's t totally clear in our mind that that's real art, right? But it really wasn't when it was created. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's capturing the zeitgeist exactly. of our now, which is yeah. consumer and um, based around things that we might not necessarily think align with uh, the artistic process or inspiration, but in fact are, are, yeah, the way we live today. Yeah, and especially the thing about zeitgeist, because I, I find it really interesting that memes or like emojis were collected by museums because that if anything you know a meme is really something that captures what was just going on for a few days in our in our art world exactly the same way as as uh, 100 years ago when these new paintings were created really fast in Paris in Montmartre or whatever you know that was also something that was I mean in a much smaller group but but anyway I think uh, that was one of the things that I found very interesting in the beginning that 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 memes were becoming culture cultural heritage because that's what it really is. Yeah. Dita Ilasko, it's been a real pleasure. And I just feel like I could carry on speaking to you for the whole Yeah, week. me too. <laughs> and thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you for your creative thought process around the three works that you've created for the Meta Art Club. We're so excited to, um, to unveil your works to our collectors and to the broader public. And, and to it's a privilege for me to be able to um, adapt your narrative and to try and tell your story to, to our audiences. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope to have an opportunity to maybe do a podcast with you at some point soon. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you, Dita. Thank you. Bye now. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>